Hi, thanks for listening to Bowties and Business. I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. As always, you can find us on our socials at Bowties and Business on Facebook and Instagram and Bowties and B-I-Z on Twitter. You can find me at Tim Kubiak just about everywhere, including Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, timkubiak.com. Today, we've got Devin Miller on. He's an attorney who just loves startups. He established his own startup while earning a law degree. He also has an MBA. And since then, he's set up several more and has enjoyed every minute of it. And he has a real passion for the business model. The prospect of a business startup should always make your heart race. I've been involved in a bunch of them. And once you get it in your new blood, there's nothing like it. In addition to being an entrepreneur, Devin is also a patent and trademark attorney. His law degree, master's in business administration. He's also got an EE degree, an electrical engineering degree, and a degree in Mandarin Chinese. So while working for a large law firm with Fortune 100 type clients, he realized that many small businesses do not have what they need in terms of proper legal resource, and startups are among those. Small businesses are what he wanted to help. So he works with owners to help them learn about patents, trademarks, and copyrights so they can build value in the business and protect those assets. This is a beautiful add-on to the conversation we had a few weeks ago with folks about bringing your product to market and Andrew Lee's and what he does there. So Devin, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the show. Hey, I'm excited to be here and always uh, always uh, have a fun time talking about uh, intellectual property. So thanks for having me. So how did intellectual property become a thing for you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really a, a combination of a, of a few things. So one of them would be, so I got going back to undergraduate, I kind of got to the end of electrical engineering and said, you know, I enjoy engineering, but I don't want to be an engineer in the sense that, you know, engineers, typically you're on it, you're a lot of times you're a smaller cog in a big wheel, you're on you're on a project for months or years, sometimes at a time, and you don't, you know, you don't get a lot of variety. And so I'm looking saying, while I enjoy engineering, I don't know that I want to do or have that as a, a lifelong career. And so with that, then I said, you know, kind of what are my other options? Or, you know, how can I because I still liked engineering still wanted to incorporate that into my career. And so I kind of had two competing interests. And one was for kind of startups, small businesses always that find that found those was exciting want to do them and then i also enjoyed uh, the legal side and you know always thought an attorney would be interesting so kind of that's where you see that i did the uh, mba and the law degree at the same time and said rather than choose one or the other i'm going to split the deck i'll do both and so it, you know i was studying the law degree and decided intellectual property is a great way to fold in law with engineering in order to with the engineering background working with a lot of startups small businesses people that are inventing and those type of things and then at the same time i can also use engineering as i've done several of my own startups and small businesses so that was kind of the genesis of what has now evolved into today where um, where i run uh, both a few different startups and do miller ip law so i gotta ask about the mandarin piece right to me sure. knowing how many things are manufactured in and with the background in supply chain mandarin has to be extremely useful especially if you're dealing with getting products produced offshore so to speak it was that the thought process or how did you get there you know a, it, it was later on, it was a thought process originally. So I served a religious mission for my church in Taiwan for a couple of years. So I originally, so I picked up the languages. I was serving the mission over there. They speak Mandarin, same as uh, in mainland China. And then as I came back, I said, well, I've already learned the language. Why not pick it up as a second degree, add that on. And so really I, that was the genesis of it. And then it certainly has the kind of the business overlap of where it's manufacturing. It's a large, you know, consumer base over there. And so it's, it's kind of been a hit or miss some part or some businesses or sometimes in my career it's been useful other times it will sit dormant for a few years because it didn't he doesn't pop up so it's kind of one of those things that i figured it may be useful certainly had the language already there and added it on that's brilliant so what was your first startup so i would you know first i would say first real startup i'm sure i had little ones as a kid or other things i enjoyed but the, fir the first real startup would probably be so when i was in mba school or doing the law degree and the mba degree at the school at the same time I, and I can't remember where it was. I think it was either a flyer or an email, and I can't remember which, but it was one of those flyers or emails that say, hey, there's going to be a business competition. Come and join in. And it was kind of one of the uh, multi, um, 
different types of degrees that you all get together. And I'm trying or blanking out on the right word. Um, but you know, multidisciplinary, that's what I was trying to think of multidisciplinary business competition to where they'd have MBAs, they'd have attorneys, they'd have engineers, they'd have designers and different things of that nature. So I said, Oh, that sounds good. Now, if I stepping back at that, at that same time, I was doing a law degree an MBA degree. I was working 20 hours a week as a law clerk. I'd already, I had a two year old and we had a newborn that we just had. So I already had a plenty b busy plate, but I decided why not? Let's go uh, sign up for a business competition as well. So went there, signed up for the business competition, met or three other people formed a group. None of us knew each other beforehand. And the first, uh, you know, the first year we uh, came up with, it was uh, something to make gym bags less stinky. Um, we took second place and said, okay, well, you know, the idea was good, but I don't think it really had commercial application. It would be too difficult to take in the marketplace. So we kind of went our own ways. Next year, the same comp, we were all juniors at the time, came back and they doing the same competition the next year. And so we all got back together. So oh, let's try go, a go of it again. So we were kind of brainstorming, coming up with ideas. You know, we had some crazy ones, self-packing boxes and other things that, you know, sounded cool, but we could never figure out how they really work. And so I remember walking back um, as we were trying to brainstorm and I just ran my first marathon or, or shortly there before and was kind of saying, wouldn't it be cool? And this was the days before Fitbit or iWatch or anything, Apple Watch or that or anything else. And said, wouldn't it be cool if you could have a wearable that could tell you where your hydration level is at? So that, that way you can basically perform better in your marathons, perform better to run. And so I said, oh, that would be, you know, a cool idea. So I called up my dad that um, had some experience in engineering as well and uh, done medical devices and kind of pitched the idea to him. Did the business comp, or I remember we went home over Christmas break. I was in Cleveland. He was in Utah at the time. Went home over Christmas break. We prototyped it up, mocked up something and got on the workbench over Christmas break while I was home came back and then we entered in the business competition and took second place and a little bittersweet in the sense that I think we had the better business, but because the original or the people we lost to had already entered in multiple years, they had more money to reinvest. And so it made it, it made it difficult to compete. Nonetheless, bought out the, or all the us partners or the people that were in the business competition with me, we're all going different ways. We're all going to different places after we graduate. And so this doesn't make sense. We're not going to be able to run a business, you know, or do anything with the idea when we're spread out across the country. So I said, how about I take the, my portion of the proceeds, buy everybody else out. And so that's what I did. So I bought everybody, all the other partners out on the competition and took that and continue to build it. And I did it for several years continued it's still an active company today it's pivoted a bit um married up with some other companies but it's still uh, continuing on still use, utilizing the technology so that was a, a long answer to a short question but that was kind of the first business that i really got involved with and still actively involved with to today so gotta ask how many full marathons have you done <laughs> Let's see. I've done one. I, I would. I'd have to think about it. It's probably six or seven by now. And how many times were you half crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I think anytime you do a full marathon, you're full crazy, half crazy. I think I've done a couple. So I started out doing a couple half marathons, and then I usually try and do. I haven't been as consistent as I want. I usually try and do about one a year. So I haven't always made it my goal of one a year, but that's kind of been the goal. That's a, that's a good goal, right? It's, it's enough to keep you in the training cycle, but not enough to kill your body. <laughs> exactly. And on that, I usually will run about eight to nine miles a day. So I usually try and keep a, keep running pretty well. Uh, yeah, you, you, you keep, you're keeping the base mileage up pretty good then. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I gave up running for yoga about four and a half years ago. So <laughs> sounds like a good trade off. You know what? It was amazing because at the time I was doing halves and I walked in and I took a 90 minute hot yoga class and I couldn't move. And I'd been lifting and running for years. And I'm like, OK, I knew I was old. I knew I was stiff. I had no idea how hard this was actually going to be and fell in love with it. So, well, sounds like a, a good marriage or a good, uh, good pivot for you. It, it was a good pivot. Yeah, I definitely feel much better for it because I was beating my body up pretty good. Mm. Um Let's talk about the small business owner, right? You you work sure. with small business owners. You work with startups. Mm. When do pe when should people show up and have a conversation, right? I've got this idea. I've got it to market. How soon? How late? Um, the easy answer, the quickest answer is as soon as you 
earlier the better is the, is a is the default answer now i'll give you a little bit of caveats to that if all you have is hey i had this idea yesterday i haven't done any research on it. i haven't even googled to see if anybody else has done it and all i have is it's a great idea and i get excited about it probably a bit early to go to an attorney or to, to start talking with them because they're not going to be able to give you any meaningful advice so in general if you have an idea and you say hey i think this is there's something to this i think you know i'd like to do something with it then at least do a bit of a research on it see if there's anybody else has done that i mean it's shocking to me and or it shouldn't be shocking because it happens enough but people come into my office and they'll say i have this great idea and you know can we protect it and i says well just out of curiosity you know has have you ever done any research have you googled it or seen anybody else that's done this we'll take five minutes and sure enough it's already popped up somebody's already come up that it's out on the marketplace and so it says well you know pro unless you can either want to just directly compete with them and there isn't any patents or other protections going to bar you you can do that but in that case i can't you know you're just going to compete right or on sales and on marketing and on other things and in that case it's probably not something that i'd help with or you need to develop the idea further so develop the idea do some research on it see what the marketplace is see if there's an actual demand for it see what if you can make a profit on it do those kind of research and then as soon as you kind of have that research in hand then i'd at least can go and engage or engage an, an intellectual property attorney now we may it may still be too early on and we may say hey you're really six months early three months early go do these things or this is where it needs to be at before you we can really help you but at that point you can at least have that strategy that roadmap to say okay now if i do continue to pursue this if i want to do something now i know this is when i should go and engage an attorney or think about these things and i kind of have this strategy in place so generally the earlier the better but do a little bit of research before you just run off with an idea how innovative does an idea have to be does it have to be net new? Can it just be a better mousetrap? Is there a percentage of a better mousetrap it needs to be? So that, and that would probably be, so giving just a very quick baseline. So intellectual property includes kind of three different things, patents, trademarks, copyrights. So patents are for inventions. It does something, has a functionality. It's a, it's a device, it's software, it's something of that nature. Trade, or trademarks are going to be for brands. So anything that's a brand, it's a catchphrase, it's a logo, it's a name of a company, name of a product, that'd be a brand. Copyrights are going to be creative. So book, a movie, a picture, a photo, a sculpture, a podcast, a whatever you want to do, anything that's creative. So now your question is probably more on the patent side of, you know, when should you be able to protect it? You know, and it, there first of all, the, there is a myth and you'll see it every once in a while it'll pop up on TV of, Hey, it just has to be so much different, 10% different or 50. And I, there's all sorts of, that's a myth in the sense that there isn't a percentage that has to be so much overlap or so much different. Uh, the one that I always like, and I love the show suits. It used to be it's on USAA. They went for a while and they had one episode that was on patents and like, Oh, it has a 15 or 20% overlap with this other one. And we have to get it down to 15. I'm like, there is absolutely nothing to do with the actual law in reality, but it was made for a good episode so as far as now what it has to be as far as actual patentability so there's a couple different standards as to patentability when you're looking at whether or not you can patent one one is what's called novelty novelty is basically is anybody else ever created this if somebody else has already invented it if they've created it then you can't get a patent on it because they've already it's already been invented the second one is obviousness and obviousness kind of has two different meanings. One of the meanings of obviousness is if you're taking something out there and just making a very obvious minor tweak to it, you're not able to get a patent. An example is, is if all cars were black, you go back to Henry Ford and you can have any car you want as long as it's black. And now you painted a car blue. Just because you painted it, technically it's different. There wasn't a blue car before that, or there wasn't a Model T in blue before, doesn't mean that it's novel or it's patentable in the sense it's a, it's a very obvious variation. People say, yeah, you could paint a car blue and it's not gonna be, you know, add anything new or anything unique, it's just different. And so you can't do that. The other meaning of obviousness is if you're to take two or more things that are already out there in the marketplace, put them together in an obvious way. Again, you're not adding anything new. You're just taking a couple of things out there. You're putting them together. So those are kind of your two standards of patentability. If you can, if you can create something that hasn't been uh, made before and you can do it in a non-obvious way, then it's generally patentable. And there's a few caveats in there that you could dive in a bit deeper, but that gives you a pretty good rule of thumb. Give me kind of an example you asked on can you build you know the better mousetrap versus building the original mousetrap yeah absolutely so give you an example let's say we go back to 1950 1940 whenever they originally came out with the original tv right so you had black and white tv 
transmitted across the, you know families and, and living rooms all over people had black and white tv and then you said somebody else came along obviously and created color television well you had black and white tv color television builds on top of the black and white television but it's something it's novel it's unique it's not obvious and so it's still patentable now how does that work basically wh whoever owns a black and white television can stop the color television from making something because they have the underlying technology Vice versa, the person with the color television patent can stop the color or black and white television from making color television. So they kind of now have to license, they have to work together or otherwise leverage it. Otherwise, they tend to block each other. So that was, again, a long answer to a short question, but it gives you a little, a little bit of insight. Along that lines, at a point, when did components become just general? So we'll stick with the televisions, right? They used hmm. to have tubes. So... Am I licensing my tube technology to all the other TV manufacturers? Or if they invent their own tubes, am I out? Oh, this, this, this is a simple question, but it's not a simple. It depends on how broad of patents you get, right? So patents can have different scopes. And the rate, way they do it is, let's look at what other people patent. So let's say you were the very first inventor of the tube technology, right? You were the one that came up with the you know vacuum tubes. They worked great, and nobody else had ever thought of vacuum tubes. And you got a broad patent. You were able to get a box out a lot of it. Then probably everybody has to funnel through you. But let, let's now take light bulb. You know, Thomas Edison, everybody thinks he created the light bulb, right? We didn't create the light bulb as much as he created the filament that went in the light bulb that lasted a lot longer with bamboo. So somebody else already had created the light bulb, but what his patent would have been in is, uh, is on the filament to make it a lot better. And so you can kind of, depending on what the scope is of your patent is to how broad you can stop others from designing around and inventing around. If you have a very broad patent, you're the first one to come up with it and you get good coverage, generally everybody has to come through you. If you get a narrower one or something that doesn't have as broad of coverage, if people can figure out different ways of doing it, new and innovative crazy ways of doing it that you hadn't thought of, then they can generally not have to come to you. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. When... When does something actually become intellectual property? Is it at the idea stage? Is it at the production stage? Is it at the market stage? So it depends on whether we're talking patents, copyrights, or trademarks, right? Because there's okay. kind of different definitions. So I'll give you kind of the short answer. So as far as when a patent becomes intellectual property, kind of two things. One is when you file, file a patent application, your patent pending means you've at least asserted saying, hey, I claim my rights to this invention and anybody that comes along after, they, they're going to infringe on me. But you, in, you know, patent pending, you haven't actually gone through examination pro process. They haven't actually said you're patentable. You've just said, hey, if this is patentable as of the date I file it, I get the rights to it. And so once you file it, you're patent pending, you don't really get the rights until it's gone through examination. And they said, yes, it's patentable. So that's on patents. Trademarks are going to be one that generally it's not until you file a trademark. Now there are some common law rights or state law rights that you get inherent when you start doing the, you start using a trademark, regardless of if you file for a federally registered trademark. The drawback with those is that you only get it for the geographic location that you're using it. So let's say you started the, you're a new restaurant, Bowties restaurants in Los Angeles, and you never filed for a trademark, but you did have, you were using it, the first one to use Bowties restaurants in Los Angeles, then you would have the trademark protection just for the Los Angeles area. But anybody else that started outside of Los Angeles, they're going to have the rights to that if they were to file a trademark on it first. So generally, until you file a federally registered trademark, same thing, you or you file it till it gets registered it goes to the examination process you don't really have the right so generally it's on patents and trademarks once they go through examination they get examined for patentability or trademark ability then you'll get the rights to them if they deem it trademarkable or patentable now copyrights are are the special if i would say of the three in the sense that copyrights you do have your inherent rights as soon as you create it so if you make the sculpture you take the painting or you make the painting you take the picture or anything else once you put it and they would say put it in a tangible medium so you take the picture and it's now an actual taken picture or you make the sculpture you write the book then you have the rights to that copyright you don't have to file it you don't have to register it now there are benefits to registering it if you ever have to enforce your copyright it makes it a lot better and you can get more damages and get more um more money for if people are to take off but you don't have to so copyrights are the one that as soon as you create it you do get those rights i'm going to ask you what i know is a loaded question <laughs> so, so how do you defend a copyright or a trademark in a search engine driven world 
Yeah, and I and I put patents probably in there as well on all of them. How do you defend them? And so let's say copyrights. In the one sense, it's difficult. On the other sense, it's easy. So we'll start with copyrights. In the sense that it is, you know, they have a lot of for images, and they're even getting them now for music. And YouTube is a great example where you can monitor a lot of it. You can go and do a reverse or image search, and you can find almost every instance of an image is being used across the internet in a short amount of time. And there are people that are going out, and and their whole business model is we we license our images, and if you right click click or right click on an image do save as and use the image without licensing it from us we're going to come give you the nasty cease and desist letter so in that sense if you're on the side of enforcing them they're getting fairly easy in the sense that you can do a reverse image search you can do a lot of times now they're getting you can do reverse almost music searches you can monitor on youtube and other things and so going out and enforcing it and then once you find somebody that's doing it you have to kind of it's a bit of a business decision as much as a legal decision in the sense that yes they are infringing your copyrights now is it worth enforcing it against them right so do you want to do that cease and desist letter engage an attorney well, it kind of depends on how valuable it is to you. If it's a you know a picture that you're not it isn't very valuable to you, you're not going to make much money off of. And somebody copied or right clicked, saved as, and put it on their website, and they're a tiny uh, blog article or blog page that has five people, probably doesn't make sense to go and enforce it because you're going to spend more on attorneys than you're ever going to get out of them. On the other hand, let's say you have the world's best video. You have the you know the viral video, and you do the whatever the new shark song is on that's on YouTube that has the most views. Let's say somebody now starts to or knock that off or starts to copy it and download it and, and reproduce it. That one has a lot of monetary value, and you're probably going to go out and hammer everybody for doing it. You're going to watch very closely, do the re or reverse engine searches on everything, watch it very closely on YouTube, and make sure to monitor it. Similar on, on trademarks, really, and, and even patents, you're going to look at it and say it's becoming easier and easier to monitor for people going against your brand as people are starting to use it because you can so easily access things online. Now, the one question I think I'll, I'll take it as, as if you asked, and I don't know if that's what you implied, but now the qu different questions is how do you enforce it, right? So you're yeah. a small startup, you're a small business, you don't have an, a ton of money, you're just trying to get up and going. How do you actually go through and enforce it on a, a against somebody that's maybe a bigger player, that's maybe better well-funded? Well, there's I, I always say that there's a few different ways, and I always look for a business answer as more than a legal answer in the sense I think that too often we're just you get riled up, you think, hey, I'm gonna go sue the world, I'm gonna show them that I'm right, and I'm gonna make you know make them pay type of a thing. And sometimes that may be the right answer, but a lot of times there's a better business option to go, pursue before you go all the way to a lawsuit. So let's say you're the small startup going against a big Goliath, right? So they can outspend you, they have more money, and it's going to be very difficult to go and enforce it today. Well, then what I'd recommend is a couple different things or a couple different options. One would be is almost every company has a competitor themselves. So you take Apple, which is a huge company. They still have Samsung that's a competitor. They have Fitbit that's a competitor. They have, you know, almost all of their product lines, they have competitors. And so while, you know, Apple may rip you off, you can, if you have something that's valuable, go to the direct competitor, go to someone else that is going to compete, that does have the funds, that does have the ability to enforce and say, hey, we can license into you, we can partner up with you, you can acquire us, and now you'll have the rights to what Apple finds very valuable, but now you're you're in a position to go and def or defend it. So that's one thing. Go to the your your the biggest competitor of the person that's ripping you off. Another one you can say is, okay, we don't have the ability to go and compete with them today, but we do, and you know, if we keep building, if we keep making a company better, five years, we may have that ability to go after them. So you may just have to bite your tongue, bide your time, wait until you have the wherewithal and say, now we built a big enough business that we can go and you know, compete with them and we can go and enforce it. So that's kind of a second option. The last one, and they get a bit of a, a bad rep and sometimes very well deserved in the industry, sometimes not, which are called patent trolls and you know you can call them trademark trolls or copyright trolls now some of them just have a unscrupulous business model where they just go and try and exact as much money off of anybody they can not very ethical business practices i'm not promoting them at all but i think there are there is sometimes that they have a role to play in the sense of a startup or small business they've invested a lot of time money and effort to go and develop a product to develop something innovative 
only to have someone go and rip it off. And because they don't have the ability to go and enforce it, they can get taken advantage of. And some of the more ethical, what I would call patent trolls or trademark trolls, are in the ability, they are in the business of enforcement, and you can actually get a deal with them that they'll go out and enforce on your behalf. And then you can split a cut of, you know, have a cut of the proceeds of what you make. So that is an option. Now, again, there's a lot of unethical ones out there. So you do need to be careful. But I think that there is a place for that, depending on where you're at. You know, it's interesting you bring that one up. I was actually holding that question. I have a background in telecom and technology. Mm. And there are a lot of individuals that operate in that enforcement space there. Mm. And I have watched large companies go after each other for 20 years. And not being inside of the machines, it can be sport and fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun to watch. And there's, there's reasons. I mean... You take big businesses, you had Samsung and Apple, and they continue to go after it, but they've had many fights. One of their biggest fights was on the phone, and it was the placement of the button into yeah. how the button looked on the phone, right? And they spent millions upon millions of dollars fighting back and forth, but they're looking at it as, hey, they use, they're smart companies. They're going to do it as a business cap or calculation. They're going to say, do we have enough of a return? Is this val feature valuable enough to us that we want to go and defend it? That we want to actually, you know, go to war, so to speak. And if it is, they're going to do the calculation saying it's as simple as that. It's worth, to, worth it to us. Apple, you know, they had the little circle. Now they've gone away because we've got away with the buttons. But for a long time, the little circle at the bottom that, you know, that was valuable. It was iconic. And so they're saying this is a, iconic enough to our brand that it's worth protecting. Now, it's fun to watch on the outside because they just battle at it and see how the, the battle goes. But I certainly think there's a reason why they do that business calculation as to whether or not it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is, especially when you're playing big dollars, right? Mm. So what about internationally? So you talked about, you know, federal trademark, et cetera. How, how do you, A, protect yourself from infringing on somebody else? Maybe somebody in the UK or the EU is using something similar. Mm. And likewise, how do you stop it from going over there? Yeah, international is a whole other whole other animal to tackle in the sense that um, there, you know, there is some people come in and say, I want to get an international patent or an international trademark. And first we have the conversation. There is no such thing as just an international trademark or patent or anything. You can't just file one place and it covers you around the whole world. So you do have to go on a country by country basis. And so typically the way you're going to do that, and we'll get into a couple options as well, but the way you're going to do that is you're going to say, okay, where is my business at today? Is my target market 90% in the U S and you know, 10% is everywhere else. And probably this makes sense to focus on the 90% in the U S so you can get protection there. The other 10%, you're just going to have to compete on brand or other things. And it probably isn't a worthwhile investment and take that as an example. I work with some medical or medical device companies and U S is a huge market for medical devices. We have, we spend the most money as a country. We do the most in development. We have the, you know, a lot of those things that we really do. It's a worthwhile investment to focus on the US and maybe the EU. And those are really your two target markets. And then you say other countries, great to have, we'll still sell into them. We'll just have to do without protection because they don't represent enough to make it worthwhile investment. On the other hand, you know, if you're saying we are, you know, 15% US, 15% the EU, 15% in Australia, 15% Japan, then you're going to have to say, okay, we've had a, a market spread off ac across in other countries. Let's target the countries that are going to make sense for us and go file in those. Now within there, there are a couple caveats. So patent side first, that you can do what's called a PCT application, which is a patent application. And that kind of gives you a placeholder for up to 30 months that you can file your application, get a placeholder in place, and then decide, you know, go in within that 30 months, you can have the option to decide which countries to go into. So you can say, hey, I don't know which countries are gonna be important to me today. Let's file the PCT application. I'll take those 30 months, go see which countries it will play out in, where, where our sales are at, which countries make sense, and then go file into those countries. So it, you still have to file into each of them separately, but it gives you a bit of breathing room and a bit of time to decide which countries to go into. Trademarks are a bit different. They have similar options. They're not quite as robust as what on the patent side is. The one nice thing is, is that the EU generally operates as a block. Now, Britain, Britain kind of broke off from them. So yeah. 
Hard, hard yeah. Brexit and Switzerland are special, right? <laughs> yeah. So most of the EU falls under one block for both patents or trademarks. Now you have to deal with Britain again on its own and separately. But generally, that's the one block that you can go and get a lot of countries in one in one filing as opposed to having to file into every single EU country separately. Yeah. And if, you, if you've never dealt with operating entities in the EU, th there's a bunch of nuances, right? <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, let's go back towards entrepreneurship. Founders, creators, maybe great innovators, not good with mm -hmm. details. How can someone like yourself help them? Yeah, so I mean, how can we help? I'll give you how we help entrepreneurs or, or how I at least set up the firm to help entrepreneurs is probably a better or better answer. In the sense that, you know, so I worked for a lot of large law firms prior to starting my own firm. I worked for top 100 law firms. I worked for clients, including Amazon and Intel and Red Hat and Ford and others. So big clients and, you know, those law firms are generally set up and, and I understand why, but to focus on the bigger clients in the sense that the bigger clients have the most reoccurring revenue, they have the biggest budgets and they are the ones that you're bringing the most money in, in that. So, I, and when, when we set up, when I set up Miller RP Law, I was really saying, hey, what the clients I really love are the startups and small businesses. And they're typically, if I were to say in the business community, less underrepresented or less represented as far as intellectual property. They don't get the same type of representation. They oftentimes can't afford the same rates or the same budget. And so it's dip, typically difficult for them to compete on the same level. So when I when we set up when I set up my firm, I said, you know, let's let's look and see what I can do as as we're structuring as I'm structuring the firm to give the, you know, to give that same level of representation to those startups and small businesses, but on a level that they can afford and that they it will be and help them to compete. So one of the things that, you know, whether it's us or others, but we do or certainly do it is flat rates. Flat rates are nice for a, a startup or small business in the sense that they can now budget or itemize, hey, this is how much can it cost me in this? Because what's really hard for a startup or small business is you go to a law firm and they say, okay, now we're going to put you in an hourly rate. And well, it's probably going to be anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000. And then you, get, you see the bill and every time you call them, they charge you half an hour for a five minute conversation. Every time they respond to an email, it's another half an hour. And so you see, well, yeah, we thought it was 10 to seven or seven to 10, but with all the extra things, it's really 12,000. And so now you've got a huge bill that you weren't anticipating and it just feels like it's ongoing. So one of the things that we do and what or, and I'd encourage is to look at a firm that does a, a flat rate fee. So you know what it's gonna cost you, you can budget for it and you can do the, the other thing that you know that we do that uh, is I think that probably the most helpful to be honest and it's one of the kind of the no brainers is on customer service and you know, you would think everybody you're in a service industry, customer service should be something you should focus on. And yet, if you were to look at the industry average for law firms across all law firms, the average is if you reach out to a law firm about 70% of the time, they just never respond back to you. They don't return your phone call. They don't return your email and they just blow you off. Now, if they do respond back to you, which is at about 20 to 30% of them, it takes them three to five days on average to respond back to you. So that means if you reach out to 10 of them on Monday, you'll hear back to back from three of them by Friday, generally, which is a horrible, you know, aggravating. First of all, you want to give them your money. You need help. You're in that situation. You're having to call a whole bunch. Most of them aren't returning. The ones that are take five days. So we looked and said, well, what can we do to be different? And so one of the things that, you know, look for whether anytime you're looking for an attorney is look for the firms are going to be responsive that are there to help to answer your calls to educate you to make sure that you know what you're doing but are quick about it and so we have a role in my firm that generally we pick up the phone we respond to the email right away if we're tied up we do or we respond within a half an hour so 90 percent of the time it's either right away or within a half an hour we respond back and 100 percent of the time our drop dead rule is we have to respond within 24 hours so the longest you're going to wait is the one day to hear back from us and so those are kind of you know you ask kind of what do we do to help the startups and small businesses but it's really just saying what can we do to reduce fees so we don't have a lot of overhead as far as huge businesses, high rises, lots of partner income. We do flat rates, we do customer service. And those are, I think, whether you're looking at our firm or any firm, those are the things, if I was a startup or a small business that I would start to look at as to why you would want, what you'd be looking at a firm is to build what's gonna be the most helpful to you. So it's, 
it's interesting because when I was doing the research for this, one of the things that about knocked me out of my chair was you talk about flat rate. I literally hit your website. And for anyone who's listening and wants to see it's Miller IPI. IPL. IPL. Or yeah. Law with Miller is the other way you can go there. Both of them work the same way. Okay, cool. And, and literally right on the page is your flat fees. Mm. Right? Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's shocking. It's like, okay, you know, then you go to all the other law firm websites. You're like, what is it going to cost? I have no idea. And it's like, you know, it should be one that I think transparency and understanding what things are going to cost you should be a given. And yet it's not. And so we, when we did it, we said, let's just put what the costs are. So they know when they come visit us, when they ask, we can just tell them. And it's not this mysterious kind of what is going to cost me. It's always going to cost me more than what I think. And yet as easy as that is, it's an anomaly within the industry. It is. So I literally just lived through putting some stuff out to bid to an attorney in the last four months, right? And we shopped at that. Here's here's what we need. Shopped at the scope of firms and the variance of answers was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and usually you have to, usually you take, if especially if they're on a billable or an hourly rate, take what they tell you and take about one and a half to two times what they tell you because by they don't usually, calc, they'll charge you for it, but they don't calculate in every time they're going to charge you for an email, every time they're going to charge you for a phone call, every time they're going to give you some additional education. And so it always takes longer and always takes more. And so, yeah, it, it's interesting how variable, how variable it is within the legal industry. You talked about, you made the comment, staff size, office size, and a focus mm -hmm. on service. Right. Can you yeah. articulate that for somebody because, you know, I'll, I need right. Not everybody had to go to Harvard. Right. There's a lot of great universities out there that aren't that one. Can mm. you make that same case for the legal profession and for what you do? Yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned Harvard and that's always, hey, I've got a Harvard attorney. I've got a Harvard law degree. Once you get out in the actual industry, as long as you go to what would be kind of a top 100 law school. And so there's kind of different rankings, different tiers. Now, if you get to a tier two or tier three, which are kind of no name and they are kind of almost a mail in type of a diploma, those ones you want to stay away from. But if you're within a top 100 law firm, as far as representation, you're going to have as good of odds of having good representation about within any of those top 100, meaning the attorney is going to do as good a job. And so, first of all, having that Harvard degree, I don't know that it provides the value that most people perceive. Now, it, it's a prestigious school. If you can get in, great, good for you. And I'm not knocking him at all. But as far as legal representation, and are, if you pay for a Harvard attorney, are you getting the value? Oftentimes, you're really not. Um, now, as far as, you know, how one question that's difficult, you know, and it's hard if you're a startup or a small business to determine who is a good attorney or who should I go with, right? Because you're generally getting into an area of life that you don't know a lot about in the sense that if you've never been through the patent process or the trademark process, you don't know what, you know, if they're telling you all the things that are correct and they know what they're talking about or not. And so it's always hard to say, who should I go with? Because I don't know enough to make a very educated decision. So in that sense, what what I would really focus on if I was a startup or a small business and trying to figure out a good attorney is one is you can certainly go to Google reviews and as you know, silly as it sounds, there are you can get most law firms will have Google reviews and the ones that you can get some of them focus more on others, but there are out there and you can get an idea of what they're what they're ranking. That's a simple and easy one. Now, if I were to say now that kind of just helps you to delineate who should, you should even reach out to or contact with. Now, once you reach out and contact with them. I would look at, are they there? To, does it feel like they're there to charge you money or does it feel like they're there to educate you or to make sure that you know why you're doing things or what, why you're making the decisions and the reasons behind it? And if they're just there trying to say, hey, this is what it costs and I'll do it and they don't help you to understand why you're making decisions, I would run in the sense that I don't think that they're going to likely have your best interest at heart. They're just trying to, as long as you'll pay the bills, they'll do the work. And as soon as you stop paying the bills, they're not going to do the work. And not that I don't want to get paid. And I, if I don't get paid, I'm not doing the work, but you want to find someone that has more of the kind of that heart of a teacher where they're saying, Hey, we're going to sp spend the time to help you understand why you're making the decisions, what the reasons are, what is the re you know, why is something patentable or not patentable? Why is it trademark or markable or not? Is it the right timing? What should you be thinking about? If you're on a budget, what are the kind of the priority list of, you know, if you can't afford everything, which one should you do and kind of take that time to actually educate you. And those ones are the ones I think you're going to, re that's probably the most representative of a good attorney is it whether or not they take that time to educate you and the last one i would say is if you're looking at and looking at trying to figure out who's a good attorney 
I would honestly go back to the customer service because everybody hates working with attorneys that never respond or reach out back to you. And if they, if it takes you several calls and a whole bunch of time to even get on their docket or talk with them to even see if they need, if you can give up your, their, give you their money, it's going to be a bad relationship out of the shoot. So I think that when you're looking at Harvard educated, not Harvard educated, doesn't really matter whether you're looking at, you know, what you're looking at is, are they going to explain things to you? Are they going to take the time? Are they going to be, or be good and responsive? And those are the things that I think you can, if you're looking to figure out who's a good attorney you're here to go with, that you should focus on. So a lot of listeners to this show are newer to business, maybe mm -hmm. even earlier stage in career. What should they really expect in a conversation with an attorney that they've chosen? Everyone has the TV impression is why I'm asking it, just to set the <laughs> stage. Yeah, I mean, TV is TV is made it or made. First of all, TV has made the legal industry a lot more interesting than it really is in the sense that, you know, the big two second aside and then I'll go back to answer your question. You know, when you see on TV, you know, I filed a lawsuit and we're in court the next day like that never happens. First of all, it takes months to get into court and it's a long drawn out process. Most cases settle. It's only like two or 3% of cases actually make it to court because all of them settle out of court before then. And so first of all, TV has wrecked everybody's impressions of the legal industry. Now I love to watch legal shows. Don't get me wrong, but they're not representative of the legal industry. Now, as far as what to expect, I mean, there is such a variety of, of attorneys and some of them are absolutely kind of the, the slick guy that has a slick hair bag that's just in there that's the ambulance tra chaser and is just trying to get ate by a living. Those ones are generally not the ones you want in the sense that they're usually the bot, not always so, but usually they're the bottom of their law school class. They couldn't get a, a job at any other or experience at other firm. And they're just trying to eke by and they're doing whatever they can to get business in. And they're going to be the, probably the more shady of the people that give the legal industry a bad name. Now, what you should expect is if you can avoid those people, then you're going to probably get kind of two attorneys. One attorney is, is going to be a good the good attorney in the sense will give you legal advice they will tell you and their standard answer is going to be it depends if you want to know the standard answer for an attorney is always it depends because they always go through and hear all the different caveats and different variables and that but they'll give you good legal answers and so they'll, they'll probably be smart they'll give you some of the legal advice but then they'll turn it over to you and say now make your decision this is you know here's the idea and those aren't bad attorneys if you know what you're doing those attorneys are very valuable the ones that you're looking for, it's kind of the third ones, and I would say the hardest to find, but are the, the ones that are worth finding are the ones that they're going to mix in the, hey, now, here's what the business overlay is. Here's how you should think about it, not just from a legal perspective, but from a business perspective. Is this the best return on your investment? Is it going to get you the most or not? You know, should you really be investing in marketing or advertising or employees or staffing up or inventory or whatever? And you're and so getting somebody with that business perspective, that's not typically what you see on TV. Those are the ones that are the hard ones. Usually you either see the go get them, punch them hard kind of go, you know, those type of attorneys. Or you're going to get the ones that are the, the slick backed hair. And neither of those are really the attorneys you want, but are generally what you see on TV. Yeah. One of the things I learned early in my career was I wanted the one that could do that business assessment. Here's mm -hmm. your here's your legal position. Here's where you're exposed. Here's where you're covered. Maybe here's your percentage of risk. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, they're still going to give you a percent. They're very hard to get it. And I'm the same way. But to give you an absolute definitive 100% answer, attorneys aren't going to do that because now they're worried that if they tell you that 100% answer, they're going to get sued because that's the only thing you remember. You told me this was an absolute sure dunk thing or you know slam dunk thing. They're never going to, and if they do run from that attorney because they're not a good attorney, but they're going to, as long as they can give you hate, if I was thinking about it, here's where I think about it. Here's what you may want to think. Here's a general, if I were in your shoes and I'm doing your business, these are where, how I'd make the decision. I think that's the good, the kind of the good trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. Am, am I in an actionable or defendable position? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Cool. Um, let's talk about startups to kind of bring this all back around. Sure. What's the craziest startup you've personally done? Oh, I don't, I didn't do it. So it's kind of a, I'll, I'll, the startup that I, I always want, I'll give you two startups that I started on, but I never really, I don't know that I call them a startup because I never got far enough down because I decided they weren't a worthwhile idea. One was I always wanted to do a, um, 
and I think everybody has an idea to do a restaurant, you know, or a food thing, just because everybody likes food, they like restaurants. And so my idea was I wanted to do Devin's Doghouse. My name is Devin and do only hot dogs and do it in a small community. I still love the idea. I still really want to do it, but I can never really justify how he's going to run it, how it have the time. Restaurants take a lot of a lot of or time, money and effort. Most of them fail. And so I never got far enough along, but I wanted to do basically just hot dogs and do it as Devin's Doghouse. But that was one that I never got far enough along. Long. The other idea that I had that I started to chase down, and again, it was more of a matter of it was going to be too much of an investment that I didn't see enough of return, but I thought it was a really good idea. So I'll share it with the people anyway. And I did put a patent on it. So if people try and steal it, they'll still run into my patent on it, but I haven't pursued it yet. Was um, that they was customer, you know, you take Uber, other crowdsourcing things, but it was for customer service, right? So one of the things that everybody hates is if you call a customer service line, either one, you go through 20 different dial-ins and you have to go through, type in 20 different numbers, and then you usually get the wrong person anyway, and they transfer you somewhere else. Or you get someone that's, you know, English is a, is a fourth language that you, that you can't understand them and that you get frustrated because they don't, they can't give you the right advice. So my idea was, and one that I still hope to do sometime in the future, but I haven't gotten to yet, is to take the basically crowdsourcing for customer service to where you get people that are very, you know, know the, as an example, they are iPhone and, and evangelists. They love iPhones. They know everything about it, but they're not, they don't necessarily work for Apple. And what you do is you, and when you need a customer service, they can sign up for basically doing small chunks of customer service. They'll get a customer service call and they can actually crowdsource the customer service representatives as are needed so that you don't have to do it as a staff up and have that as a full-time basis, but rather you just do it as a one off or you just have it as needed you can scale up and scale down and you just find those people that are going to be neat or that have that expertise already that are going to provide good customer service and then you'd have ranking in there to make sure that people are ranked well that you're getting the only the people and then there's a whole lot of caveats that's still one that i think i, I want to pursue someday but it's going to take a lot more time money and effort to pursue than what i have or the bandwidth right now that's actually a really slick idea i you know i've used a lot of the graphics people and programmers and stuff like that to do it for customer service. That's brilliant. So that's what I, that's, that's my idea that's out there and some, or maybe someday some, I'll, I'll still create it. In the meantime, I filed the patent on it and it's, it's put on the side until I have the time to go after it. <laughs> nice. What didn't I ask you that it's probably obvious to you, but maybe not to me or to the listeners that we should know when looking at, you know, any part of this, this conversation. Yeah, and it's, it's probably, I don't know that it's a new one because we touched on it early on in the conversation, but probably worth repeating is, you know, it's never too early to go talk to an attorney or to talk to someone, whether it's an attorney or any expert in a given industry. So if you're wanting to talk to, talk to a tax person, I would go talk to them earlier than later. If you need, if you have IP or intellectual property questions, go talk to an attorney earlier than later. And I'd say that's kind of a, a truism across the board for almost every industry. Find the people, if you're not an expert in something, find the person that is an expert and at least go and talk with them. Now you may get the answers I mentioned, it's too early, I can't help you right now, come back in three months, this is where you should be before. But it's always easier to reach out to that individual to get that strategy and get that roadmap in place earlier on than the alternative. And the the reason I say that is the alternative, and I was talking with the client and without disclosing client information, even just a, a day or two ago, and we we're having a conversation that says, okay, we finally want to get a patent on what we've been doing. Now we've been doing it since the 1990s. And, you know, and, and then I said, well, just, so let me just ask you a quick question because in patent law, if you put something out in the public for more than a year, then you are, and you haven't filed a patent on it, you're barred from getting a patent on it, meaning you you donated it to the public domain. And so I said, so now what you're doing today, you've been doing since the 1990s. And they said, yeah, we've been doing the same thing. I said, well, as much as I'd love to help you, you know, I really, there's anything I can do on the patentable side because you only have a year to file a patent on. And so they'd waited, you know, now that's an extreme case. They waited almost 30 years before they ever got around to filing a patent on it. And now they're saying, so what you're telling me is we're kind of hosed on the patent side. And I said, yes, sorry to tell you, give you the bare bad news. I'd rather give you the honest answer than just take your money and file something I know is going to get an, a rejection on it, but that's going to be your issue. And so with that, you know, kind of that frame of mind, and I see the same thing on trademarks and you see somebody that has 
brands that they've been building for 15, 20 years. And they say, oh, we, you know, they hear a podcast or they hear something else or they read something online and they say, oh, we should probably look into getting a trademark. And then they only come to find out somebody else has been trademarked that before them or even after them, but they registered it with the federal government first. And now they're looking at what do we do? Do we have to go rebrand? We've been doing this brand for 15 or 20 years. Do we go and have to buy a light or take a license and reach out to our competitor that we really don't want to do? And it creates that issue. So generally going and talking and getting that strategy and that roadmap in place early on it's always better and it's it's not too early to at least get that strategy and that roadmap in place that's that's fantastic so for everyone listening you can go to strategymeeting.com you can book an initial conversation obviously in the show notes so devin thank you so much for being here hey it's been a pleasure and it's always fun to chat you'll you'll never have you'll never it's never a hard time for me to to chat about intellectual property because i love it Thanks again.